So, I'm your hostess, Lydia Glider Shelley, and Larry K. Mason, the author of Invisible Hand, is here too. And tonight we're going to talk about ride sharing and how the on demand economy sort of sets the stage for the economic system that's outlined in the novel that Larry wrote, Invisible Hand, which um, it, it, it actually, it, 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 it's, it's a precursor I, the way I see it, but we're still using the old type of money. So anyway, before we get into that, I also wanted to mention that later in the show, we're hoping to have Harry Gruber with um, his Capiasis project to tell us about how they're bringing the world one step closer to seeing this economic system become a reality, possibly worldwide. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, I'm not sure when he's going to show up, but he's on the West Coast. And uh, well, we're hoping he hasn't forgotten. <laughs> anyway, so ride sharing. I drive for Uber. And for those who don't know about ride sharing, what we do is we take private cars and we pick people up, um, sort of like taxis, except we don't pick them up curbside like a taxi does. We're, we're called through an app and the app uh, connects riders with drivers. For example, if I'm sitting here at home, um, I can take the app and, and, and go online with it on my phone and If you look closely, let me get it up. I can't, I can't see it. Can you see it, Perry? Um, I can't not. I can't. Okay. Well, you just at, the have to trust the screen, at the top of my screen is a button that says go online. And basically, that's how I work. There's no schedule or anything. I just hit go online. And once I hit that button, um, it, the system hooks me up with somebody nearby who needs a ride. Now that can be, I can hit that button sitting here in my room and then go out when it, when I get a request or I can do it when I'm in the car driving around and it, sometimes the person requesting is right next to me. I mean, I, I'll be uh, driving past a parking lot and that person will actually be in that parking lot. So, so it's very efficient when it works right. And sometimes, and, and like I'm know, talking, does Uber know where you are? Does the app know where you are? Yes, it's all it's all the GPS. On so on the GPS system. Yeah, the GPS keeps track of where everybody is. The problems that I've had with it are minimal. Um, today, today a few times, um, I believe that the app glitched and dropped. The, the connection between the rider and myself, but it just simply picks another rider and uh, a driver for the rider, and so the rider doesn't experience any problems when that happens. It, the rider able to communicate with you before you actually arrive physically in their presence? Yes, the, they can talk to you either through uh, text or calling you through the app so it, it doesn't show me their phone number or them my phone number. But you, the, the app will take care of dialing for them? If it, if no, they, if I, have to, I would have to pull over and call if I had a, an issue. Um, but uh, quite often the, the, the writer will call me before I get there, especially right. if they're in a place that's hard to find. How, how does the rider know that you're the correct one to the, the well, one that, to the now that can be a problem and I actually wrote and suggested a fix for it um, right now they give us the name but there could be ten Johns oh, and, yes. and, and ten of us could show up in white SUVs so it could be very confusing so what I recommended that they do is initiate a token program that will cause our phones to recognize each other and that 
they'll start to chirp when the rider gets close. Really close together. Like and, the, Geiger counter. the closer they get to you, the more it'll chirp until it just trills. Right. And I, I recommended that because of watching a, a video where a woman tried to take someone else's Uber and it had kind of disastrous results for her career, apparently, among other wow. things. Um, she's notorious on the Internet now. But the ho whole point is that we want to make sure we get the right rider because uh, otherwise the wrong person gets charged for the ride we give. So if I take John Smith and I was supposed to take John Doe, then John Doe gets charged for John Smith's ride, and John Smith might be going farther than John Doe. So <laughs> it, it all gets fixed by Uber in the end if something like that does happen, but we don't want it to happen. Yeah, prevention is better than cure. Yes. Right. So I'm hoping that they'll, they'll take my token idea to the programmers and get it out there quickly. Now, do you have any control over how much the writer is charged? I used to, but they changed the way I could communicate with them. It used to be afterward I could uh, submit a request to uh, charge them whatever I agreed on with the writer or even to not charge them at all. But they took the option out of the, the section where it was. And now um, you can still do it, but it's a lot more complicated. It would be nice if they would make a simplified way for us to negotiate price with the writers because quite often there are these things called surges that when the demand is high, the price gets astronomical. And I personally don't feel good about charging people those rates. If somebody else does, that's their own um, business. It's, but personally, I would prefer to offer the ride for a lower price and still take rides. Right now, I just turn off the app and go home when the surge gets too high. Because when the surge gets too high, demand diminishes. Unless it's something like New Year's Eve when people were so drunk they didn't know how much they were spending. How much is, how high did the price get in some of those surges? In some of the surges, it has gone as high as 9.9 .9 times, which means a $10 ride would cost you $99. And wow. That's uh, unacceptable yeah. to me. And, and to anyone with any real ethics, I, I, some, of the, some of the drivers are really greedy. And I, you know, I understand you know, hustling. I understand you know, making what you can make when you can make it. But some of them just chase these surges and drive only surges. And they do make astronomical amounts of money because the prices get astronomical. But um, again, I, I prefer to earn what I feel uh, that my service is worth and not an inflated amount based on circumstances, which to me amounts to price gouging. Mm. Uh, it seems to me that um, the Uber can, can detect and can gather data on the amount of time the ride takes from the point of pickup to the point of delivery, uh, the mm. distance traveled, uh, even though the <coughs> may be close together, since it's able to keep up with GPS, it, like every they do. They, the, well, and so forth. the time, uh, the distance, all of that is pretty much kept track of with the app, and there's also something called Uber Pool, where people share the ride, and the app s says, "All right, these two people are near each other, and they're going to locations near each other." So it has you pick both of them up and take them both at the same time. That way you get more for the trip and they each pay less than they would have. If right, right, long. exactly. So everybody wins that way. Wow, that's cool. Uh, now I, I can see how one might want to compare this with uh, what I'm proposing and what I would expect, so I could be wrong of course, what I would expect to happen with the free market money system. Um, for one thing, you wouldn't know ahead of time how much benefit you were going to be generating by giving someone a ride. And also, uh, there would be no surges. 
uh, just because there were a lot of people that wanted to ride because it's raining or because it's, it's prom night or whatever, that wouldn't run the price up. Because no, but, you know, the computer might notify more drivers to go to that area like the surge works now. If, say, there were, for example, I, I got sent a notice. There's going to be a concert, a, a, a sporting event, I mean, that's going right. to have like 10, 15,000 people. So it would notify more people to go there in, in that event. Or, see, at least with free market money, they'd be saying, this is going to happen. A lot of people are going to need rides. If you're willing to share... So plan whatever. accordingly. Right. Uh, let us know and so forth. Um, and obviously, you don't need anybody's permission to provide such a service. And your reputation would be available. You, know, you, you pull up in your car and say, OK, I'm here. You need a ride. And they say, well, let me know what your reputation is. And, and you have well, a background. We have sort of a reputation system because we have a rating system. Right. So that's kind of a precursor to the, the reputation system in that they can rate you from one to five stars. And if you rate somebody lower than three stars, you're supposed to never, ever get matched up with that person again. I should think not, yes. And we're, we rate the writers, too. But personally, I've never given less than five because we have to immediately complete that process before we can go on to the next pickup. And I'm not going to sit there and think about what I want to rate a given rider. I just automatically right. give five stars. Another difference is that with uh, free market money, uh, the amount of time it took and the, the uh, distance you had to travel and how heavy the traffic was and so forth would not be factors that would be taken into account in determining the pay one got, if any, for providing the ride. Um, if one provides a ride and it's helping a fugitive escape from the justice, well, that might actually, <laughs> that might actually reduce your future income. Uh, on the other hand, if How likely is the computer to call you to give a ride to such Well, a again, the, 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 the computer uh, is simply going to say, you know, this person has asked for a ride, or you don't need to ask the computer. You say, you just be, you know, you see, you see a guy standing at the curb waving his hand, you know, like a, people the flag down taxi, and you pull over and say, well, what can I do for you? You say, I need a ride to so-and-so. Okay, climb in. And, well, that's all you need to do. You could set mm -hmm. up your own ride. Well, now, with the ride sharing, we, we don't do it like a, a cab. I mean, people don't just jump in for a ride. We They have to be called through the app. Right. And again, that's a, a, an aspect that would be different than you, would, would be the case with free market money. Um, with, with the free market money, uh, there, there wouldn't be any need for you to, to stimulate to call the app. <clears throat> you could tell a computer, "Hey, you know, I'm, I've got nothing to do this afternoon. It's a beautiful day. I'd love to get out and drive around in the warm sunshine after all that winter weather. You know, what, what's something I can do to, to do some, provide some benefits as well? We've got you know, too many people need to be taken to the airport. How about that? Okay, I'll be happy. You could do it that way." But another thing is, you know, that fugitive would probably, I mean, it would have passed a thousand cameras to get to your car, and somebody would have seen it. The computer would say, fugitive approaching your car, you know? It, it, there's, it's, it, there's every likelihood that when you approach the car, you'd say, you know, would you like a ride? And, and the computer said, this, uh, this uh, so person is a fugitive from justice. He's being, uh, he's, you know, He's wandered in, in, you know, down the roadways, and said, "You want me to take you to the to the police? <laughs> you know, give you right to turn yourself in, or do you, would you rather continue to to run away and so on?" So uh, there, there, there might there, be there, some benefit to be gained from talking him into giving up peacefully. <laughs> exactly, you could actually, you know, gain earnings for that. But let, let's say somebody gets into the car. And like it's a pregnant woman, and suddenly she goes into labor. Now, taking a, a pregnant woman in labor, especially if it turns out to be a problem pregnancy, to the emergency room or to the hospital, is going to earn you quite a lot of money, even though you, it, it's a short distance or, or whatever. Uh, and that, again, is automatic. Not so, to mention if you have to pull over to the side of the road and deliver the baby. 
it, that will earn even more money <laughs> if you're successful. Uh, <laughs> of course, if, if you, you if got you panic, so. if you panic and run into a, a light pole or something like that because of the, the, the woman in the back going through the labor, uh, well, that might cost you some money and so forth. So it, it's all going to depend on the, the benefit. The See, that's benefit. another thing the computer could tell. A doctor passing by that there is a woman giving birth by the side of the road. Absolutely. With the on-demand economy and, and and the more connected everything gets, the more benefit can be generated. And the easier it is to coordinate things to to say you know hey you can you can earn money by doing so and so, uh, so the opportunities to help become very easy to come by. But we've used up at least half our time. And yeah, I think, I think it's time to introduce Perry and let him uh, tell us what's going on with Kapiasis. Uh, yeah, how do you pronounce it, by Perry the way? Uber. I think you copiosis. On the West Coast. Copiosis? Copiosis. West Coast yeah. of the United States, that is. Yes. So, yeah, what do you want to, what do you want to know? Thank you for having me here. Tell, tell us what you'd like to be, anybody that happens to watch this to know. Okay. Um, well, we've had really great success in promoting Larry's innovation uh, around the world, actually. And um, we have, you know, it's, this is something that I, I really honestly didn't think was possible, the uh, creation of these demonstration projects, not just in the United States, uh, in about five cities now, but also around the world. Uh, and the demonstration projects, a lot like Uber, are not full examples of the innovation, but they're uh, minimal viable pro projects. So mi the minimal viable functions that can make the thing, <laughs> that can make the thing work is making it work. And um, we've had uh, a number of conversations with the what I believe to be the two leading organizations in this space, which is the Venus Project and the Zeitgeist Movement, in terms of creating a future that's wholly different than what we have today, uh, not in terms of, of yes. promoting Larry's idea. Um, and we've gotten really strong support from the membership of both of those organizations. Both of those organizations have to in total four million people uh, in their, in their, as members, and so it's a great group of people to connect with and spread the word, and as a result of reaching those people, we've had really tremendous success. In, in fact, um, the leader of the Zeitgeist movement, Peter Joseph, was the one responsible for having me go to Athens in Mar th March this year to talk about this innovation. Um, and by the way, I should mention that um, the innovation is very similar to Larry's ideas. The, the real difference is the, the and even I was going to say the real difference is the implementation, but even that follows a lot of what Larry wrote in Invisible Hand. It's not identical, and it couldn't be, right? Because couldn't be absolutely right, not. Right. It has to adapt to the to the to reality. The yeah, to reality. Thank you, Lydia. And so it's um, but it's it is attracting a lot of attention because, as Larry probably already knows, he has answered many questions that other people have not even considered. And so, and so... That's what happens when you think about something for 40 years. <laughs> exactly, right. So it's, it's really blowing people's mind that, that it's so well thought out. And so it's, it's fantastic. And then the, the algorithm that we created in Copiosis to, um, to supplement the payer organization, I'll say, is really attracting attention too because people didn't think you could come up with a mathematical formula that could begin. I'm not saying it, it accomplishes it 100 percent or perfectly, but begin to uh, um, quantify net benefit produced from an action. So people are really turning on to that as well. Uh, so yeah, we've had a lot of success so far. I think 2016 is really going to be the heyday of Larry's innovation because more people around the world are going to find out about what we're doing and then I, oh, I really... Out of four million people is a lot of people. It is, Larry, it is. And so um, I'm just really encouraged by what we've produced so far. And you know, how long ago was it that we first started talking on gather.com? I mean, 
Gather isn't even Gather anymore. Oh, it's not. Wow. It's just some kind of a news website, but you know, there's no user-generated content anymore. Wow. It, uh, and, and I didn't know it was going away, so I didn't save any of my stuff. Oh, no. <laughs> so, yeah, it's been a wild ride the last two and a half years, and the next ten years are going to be even better, I think. Well, if enough people find out about it, and, and they can be persuaded to actually read the book instead of the lies that people will tell about it, yeah. then I think that we have a good chance to save humanity, yes. I agree. I agree. Uh, at some point, if, if it keeps moving forward, the book will be just history behind it. <laughs> Well, yeah. all I can say is that I'm hoping is that one day the book will become trivial, unimportant, and nobody bothers to read it. <laughs> because there's so much evidence in the world. Because, because the idea is so well known that they don't have to. The book's outdated. <laughs> yeah, exactly. the, the book simply becomes you know, a, a footnote to history, like uh, <laughs> the pen that uh, Abraham Lincoln used to sign the uh, Declaration of the, uh, what was it, the... Uh, the Emancipation Proclamation. The Emancipation Proclamation. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's interesting and all that, it's, it, but I mean, it doesn't really matter anymore. Now what matters is what people are actually doing. Yes. Yeah. But you're getting people to actually do it. Have you noticed that people find it actually fun to do nice things for other people? That yeah. Me, that's one of the best things about it. It really is, Larry. We're, we're discovering that the participants are uncovering a lot of the conditioning that they experience in this current situation yes. by participating in just the minimal functions that we have in, this, in our demonstration projects. So you're right. It's, and people get so excited. In fact, it's funny because none of the demonstration projects that we're launching around the world, none, no one is, is similar to the other. They're all different. Right. And and in Chico, the people honestly, the people are doing things they don't even care about the net benefit reward that they're getting. <laughs> they that just want. The, ultimately, that's probably going to be the, the thing. You, you, we don't have to worry about paying people anymore. It, they just say it's just the norm. Just people expect everybody to do that, and and, and the social pressure of, of a reward nature, it, being respected and honored, and and so forth. It's more than enough to keep people on the right path. I mean, yes, I totally agree, Larry. And th but then on the other side, so there's a guy here in in um, in Portland, and this is another example of how people are uncovering their conditioning. He came to uh, the preschool where I live to uh, install a cat door, and he was expecting. You live in a preschool? Yeah, my my wife, um, she has a preschool in our house, and so. Cool. Kids are here every every day except for Saturday and Sunday, um, but we have these animals that use this cat door, and our cat door broke, uh, so we had to get it replaced. And this this guy, relatively new to the project, offered to, to install this cat door. Now he's paid out in his day job. He's a construction guy, and he's probably paid. He does construction sales, not actual construction. Right. He probably makes a hundred plus dollars an hour doing his sales. So there he is putting in a cat door. <laughs> yes, but and he really about he really has a, a ego attachment to the amount of money his time is worth. Right. So when he was building this, putting in this cat door, he was expecting the net benefit of putting in that cat door to be equivalent to the, the hourly wage. Yes, exactly. So it took him like an hour and a half to put in this cat door, and when he received the the algorithm calculated result, which, which was about 250 net benefit reward, he felt that that was way less. That he was being underpaid. Yes, that he was being underpaid, yes. Um, so we're going to have a meeting and I'm going to yeah. walk him. And What's the, that? Way, the way it should work is that he continues to get like a royalty type payment every month as long as that cat door is still functional, right? Well, correct, but currently the software that we have written does not does not it's not an it doesn't allow re recurring payments right. like that. Yeah, it so will that, eventually. That would be really really difficult to to implement. Thank you, Larry. <laughs> that's what my programmers they're like. Are you crazy? <laughs> <laughs> right, but that's essential to make it really really good. Yes. Because yes. Because that's 
that that can help people, you know, get past the intellectual property paradigm, you know, with right. if they know that they're going to get paid in a similar fashion to royalties or residuals, then they they may not be as um, hesitant to accept the new system when right now there. People get paid in a lump sum, or, or you know, maybe installments or deposit and whatnot. Or not getting fired. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's a different way to look at it, you know. Right. Yeah, but what's interesting is that this. So there's this one set of people who are really excited about what you said, Larry. They they just find it really fun, and in uncovering the conditioning that they're experiencing today. But there's this other group of people who are uncovering different types of conditioning, and it's pissing them off. <laughs> of <course. laughs> yes. I think also when they realize that they get to keep all that they earn, and that there's no taxes, well, there hopefully won't be because <laughs> we envision it. Well, it, 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 <laughs> and, and stuff like that, it 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 changes it, you know. And, and also the fact that people get to keep. Everything they have before the transition, yeah. Because I, I think a lot of people are so invested in what they currently have, and, and are afraid of losing it. Yes. And even but, if it's worthless. Yes. <laughs> so there's a couple other things I want to commend Larry for, uh, and I get I get this so often from people who are trying to do similar things, but they're actually similar is not the right word. Kind of similar. <laughs> okay. um, Rep approximations are similar. Yeah. That's it. Yes. That they're they're tr they're trying to do things at the local level um, through volunteerism that they expect will, as they say, starve the system if enough people participate in these local level projects, not understanding the interconnected network that is our current system. Um, the, the, the primary example of that being debt and how money works. And so they, they don't, and I don't say this to them, but they don't realize that their system, their, their plans fail before they start because they don't address the interconnected nature of m that money creates with debt. And if you can't eliminate that, there's no way that your idea is going to enable the release of assets that could produce the things you need in the system. So um, people are looking at this this idea that you have, Larry, and they're just marveling at the completeness uh, and the understanding of the nature of how money has created this inter money and debt has created this interconnected nature, interconnected web of that's intractable really, unless you come up with these solutions that you come up with. Well, there may be other solutions, but none of them have occurred to me. Yeah, exactly. I was really, really lucky for this one to occur to me. No, yeah. if they have occurred to anybody, and anybody's tried them, they haven't worked yet, or we'd have heard more about it. Right, right. It's funny that I had this um, really negative guy attack me on Reddit because he claimed that there was no way this idea could work because... I don't have an economics degree. And <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to explain to him that the originator doesn't have one either, and yet he has come up with this really complete solution. But this guy just cannot fathom in his paradigm that you can come up with an alternative to capital or alternative to the current system without an economics degree. Well, all the people with their economics degrees haven't succeeded in making the world work yet. And that we're still having the same problems that money provided thousands of years ago. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so it's been an interesting ride interacting with people on both the positive and the not so positive. Um, and the positive has far outweighed the not so positive experiences. And you must I don't be know. A really if... good salesman, then. Oh, you thank you. A really good salesman. Thank you, Harry. It's it's been. It's been ex it's been fun, like you say. It's been fun. Um, there have been some downer periods where I've just thought to myself, "Why did I even start this?" <laughs> to be honest with you, um, but been there, done that. 
<laughs> yes, but the the positive aspects have been really great. Um, you know, people are are beginning to uh, beginning to see the value so uh, so clearly that they're willing to put down you know ten ten dollars a month every single month for eighteen months um, to make this thing a reality. And so I believe more people are going to do that, which will enable us to create more uh, opportunities for people to experience your system. Um, around the world, and I think that's great. Well, again, if they learn what's causing the problem and that there is a solution, that's 90% of what we need. I totally agree with you. Yeah. yeah. Well, we went over time a little bit, but oh, thank you for joining us, Perry, and telling us what's going on, and we'll have to do this again after you go to the conference. Especially. Sounds yeah, sounds great. Yeah, so in, in uh, early April. Sounds or whenever, fun. whenever your event is scheduled in April, yeah. Well, if we can get Larry away from his coaching schedule. Well, <laughs> being Friday night, there's a really good chance we can. Okay, great. Thank you, guys. All right. You. See you guys soon. Okay. Bye. -bye. Goodbye.